is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and no, it's not Surface Pro 4 in black, though wouldn't that be a neat thing if they did that? This is a Dell Latitude, the 5285 to be exact, and this is obviously their Surface Pro 4 competitor, and it has a couple of familiar features, like a kickstand that has that much travel on it, a 12.3 inch display, a type cover, just like Surface Pro 4. So why would you buy one of these instead? We're going to find out now. Well, the resemblance is uncanny, isn't it? So for those of you who, when I reviewed the Techlast X5 Pro, which is another Surface Pro 4 clone, this one, a Chinese import one that's around $500, you can see that they're not the only company that's doing that. And Microsoft doesn't mind because when they created the Surface products, what they wanted to do was to make Halo products that people would really want and to inspire designers of other competing manufacturers really, to make really good looking designs too, because Microsoft wins no matter what. If Windows PCs sell, they make money, right? So they're okay with it. But nonetheless, it, it's kind of like, you, know, you got to say that intellectual property wise here, we don't give as much cred to a company that is doing straight on copying. So just about the same thing. So why does the Dell exist? Because Microsoft doesn't update their products very often. They're not really in the PC hardware business so much as just making Halo brand devices every so often. So we're still here with Intel 6th generation Skylake CPUs. We still don't have USB-C or Thunderbolt 3 on the Surface Pro 4. Whereas Dell is constantly coming out with new products and the Latitude line particularly is aimed at business buyers. So IT companies who have contracts with Dell and buy a lot of Dell computers and maybe they're not into you know, buying some Surface products. There's a reason. Seventh generation Intel KB Lake CPUs inside of the Dell and two USB-C Gen 1 3.1 ports. So you've got those modern things that we've been hoping to see in the upcoming Surface Pro 5. If and when it's released, I'm sure it will be released. We just don't know when. Obviously, those points will become moot once Surface Pro 5 does get updated when it comes to your, your CPU and your USB-C ports. But the whole corporate buying thing, well, that's a whole nother can of worms, isn't it? That's not going to change for those of you who are IT folks looking to buy for your business. They are almost identical in weight and in thickness. The Dell is a little bit thicker, like one millimeter thicker. There's a couple of ounces different difference in the weight. That's also in terms of the load that you're carrying. I don't think most people are going to notice the difference on them. There's no Intel Core M option for the latitude, however. So for those of you who want that quiet fanless design or, you know, you just care about the price and you want it to be as inexpensive as possible, that's not going to happen here. Pricing, however, is set for obvious parity with the, the Surface line. So this Latitude starts at $899, and that's a Core i3 there that's on your base model. And it goes all the way up to around $1688 for a nicely equipped Core i7 with 16 gigs of RAM and a PCIe SSD inside, and there are different models in between. The two cheapest options, however, don't come with the keyboard cover, which is a Surface type cover clone, or with the pen. The more expensive options do. And then from there, you can customize these so you can get even more expensive. In fact, our review loaner, which has just about every feature possible, and a 512 gig PCIe NVMe SSD sells for almost $2,000. You can get it with four, eight, or 16 gigs of DDR3 low power RAM inside. There's no 32 gig option, and it's one of those sealed designs. So you're not gonna open this and upgrade the RAM, and I'm sure the RAM is soldered on board. Though the website lists Qualcomm Atheros Wi-Fi, ours has Intel 8265AC Wi-Fi with Bluetooth, and there's optional LTE 4G as well, and Y gig also. Tablets like this have integrated graphics. So you have Intel HD 620 graphics. There's no Intel Iris option, at least not at this point. That's something that Surface Pro 4 was doing on the highest end SKUs. These are, of course, 15 watt Ultrabook CPUs, the same thing you'd find in any Ultrabook or your more powerful tablet, obviously, too. So faster than the Core M indeed. Has a fan inside? Yes. Will you hear it? Most of the time not, but if you're pushing it on something like uh, big Photoshop files, Adobe Premiere, or, or playing a game, you will hear them. It gets toasty on the back. It doesn't get burning hot, and you can see our little FLIR pictures here, our thermal pictures, give you an idea of the temperature on it. Given the corporate focus, we have some CPU options that support vPro also. You can get the i5-7300U and the i7-7600U, in addition to the usual 7200U Core i5 and the 7500U Core i7. 
Security is also a focus, again, for corporate buyers. So there's different back covers on this. Now, I don't think they mean that as a removable back cover, but there's different builds you can get. Ours doesn't have any of the biometrics built into the backside, but you can get it with a fingerprint scanner, a smart card reader. Yes, remember those. They still do get used, and NFC for NFC-based security, too. It's $40 over the base price if you want the smart card and fingerprint and NFC together, $35 if you want one does everything but the smart card reader. Now the keyboard cover on this is pretty much a clone of the Surface type cover, except for this has a rubbery texture versus the suede finish on the Surface cover. Uh, the only choice in colors is black. It's corporate. You know, you're not going to get those fancy zingy crazy cyan blue type cover finishes. It feels almost identical. And you know what, I like the Surface Pro type cover, so I get along with it just fine. I, and the, the rigidity is the same. I think it's pretty adequate. You're going to hear a little bit of vibration sound when you hit it on the desk. The track pads are just about identical as well. And it has backlighting too. And it attaches via, well, what a surprise, just like Surface, a magnetic pogo pin connector like so to the bottom. This one has little feet that stand the tablet up a little bit, which doesn't really, to me, make much of a difference either way in terms of actual use. And the back side is a kind of, well, I don't know, a tweedy sort of look. It's a fabric-y sort of wipe, wipe it and clean it fabric on the back. So the kickstand on this opens all the way up. When you first pop it up, it springs to about that level. So anything here, it pretty much wants to start at that angle. And then it goes up and you feel resistance, but keep going. It's just these get stiffer. And the idea is so that when you put it on the desk, there's enough resistance to stop it from collapsing when you're writing on it. It's, yeah, it's kind of strong enough to do that. Depends how heavy your hand is. And it can go as far as this. So if we put it on the desk, it's like so. That's the farthest point. Obviously, it's going to be very sturdy there. And let's go like that. And yep, you see what I mean? So you can't have too heavy a hand. Surface is a little better at holding up. But at this angle, well, <laughs> Yeah, you get the idea. It's a tough design, isn't it, to do that, but th this angle is pretty good right here. And that is very good because you've got physics in favor of keeping it up pretty sturdy there, but I don't think most people at this angle of use are going to be too heavy. It's only when you start to open it up that you have that pro whoop, <laughs> problem and sank on its own. While we have the flap up, not unlike Surface Pro 4. Again, here is our micro SD card slot. This is a little door. You push it in, you will assuredly lose it. And there's optional 4G LTE, and the nano SIM card slot would go there. We don't happen to have that on our model, so that's where those are. The display is 12.3 inches, and it's IPS. It's 1920 by 1280, not 1080, so that makes for the same 3 to by 2 aspect ratio as Surface Pro 4. However, it is considerably lower resolution because Surface Pro 4 is 2736 by 1824. Dell makes up for that though with even higher brightness than Surface Pro 4. Now, Surface Pro 4 is pretty bright at around 384 nits, but Dell hits 499 nits of brightness. So, for those of you who are vertical market folks and you need to use this outdoors, uh, real estate agent insurance, that sort of thing. Well, that's really a good selling point. It's Gorilla Glass 4. It has glare, obviously, but not too terribly bad. For those who care, it's a Bo Hydus made display. It doesn't look quite as gorgeous and as vibrant. It's not just about the resolution there compared to Surface Pro 4 that has just slightly better color gamut, but way higher contrast ratio. And is one of the more stunning displays on the market, that Surface Pro 4. This one's still pretty nice. You get 95% of sRGB, for example, and 73% of Adobe RGB, which is in keeping with the price range. And you can see the rest of the metrics there on screen. The only thing that was kind of shocking was the screen temperature native was 8200 Kelvin, which is extremely high, but it calibrated down pretty well. And what that means is it tends to look a little blue-green unless you calibrate it. So the port story, it's a little bit more modern here. We have two USB-C 3.1 Gen 1 ports. They both support DisplayPort out. They have that logo on the side to give you that idea. One of them you may have to be using for charging, depending on whether you need to plug this in or not. So of uh, those two, one is obviously always available. The other is only available when you're not charging. Of course, there are splitters on the market that will split and include charging in USB Type A and DisplayPort and HDMI and Ethernet. Just about anything you want these days is available. It also has a traditional USB 3.0 Type A port on it, and of course a headphone 
sound jack as well. So a little bit more modern than Surface Pro 4, and that's a plus. Also has stereo speakers, decent sounding for a tablet of this size, uh, certainly adequate for watching movies in a personal space. Battery life, Dell claims up to 12.5 hours. <laughs> yeah, You know, battery claims from manufacturers are always very optimistic, and I'm sure that is with the lowest end model, the Core i3 with four gigs of RAM and the smallest SSD, because those are gonna have the best battery life, those low end configurations. Still, the 45 watt hour battery did pretty well. We have the Core i7 here with 16 gigs of RAM and a 512 gig PCIe NVMe SSD. So that's a pretty demanding configuration there. And I've been averaging around seven and a half to eight hours of use, which is pretty good. It's actually outlasting my Surface Pro 4, even though the, the battery is not appreciably bigger or anything at 45 watt hour. That's what brightness set to 30%, only because the display is so bright that, that to equal 140 nits, which is where we try to be with testing, well, you have to go down to 30%. It's bright. It does have automatic brightness. That's a feature that's happily been disappearing from tablets and laptops, and I found it too twitchy. I disabled that. And even then, I saw some brightness shifting. It was driving me crazy when I was trying to draw with it, so I had to disable Intel's display power management as well to get rid of some of that shifting. It comes with a compact 45-watt USB-C charger, and they'll sell you a 65 watt if you want for $3.50 more. I don't know why. Maybe a little bit faster charging. It does support express charge, including the 45 watt charger. And it does charge pretty quickly. Full charge on this battery in about two and a half hours in our test. Okay, as mentioned, the pen is included with the more expensive models, not the cheapest ones. You can, of course, buy it separately, and we'll put the pen model in the description below so you can see which one it is. It's a lot like the last Wacom AES pen that we looked at for the Dell XPS 13 2-in-1. It's a slightly different model number. It's a little bit longer. They both seem to work interchangeably. This is Wacom AES with 2048 levels of pressure sensitivity. There is a clicky button on the end that, much like the Surface Pro 4 pen, uses Bluetooth, and there two coin cell batteries that you have to load in it as well as the quadruple A battery that powers the writing section. So the active component is actually in the pen here. Now the pen works out of the box but doesn't do anything special in terms of pressure sensitivity or anything so I downloaded here it is Wacom's feel it driver as they call it for tablet PC. So you can see the URL there if you happen to be in the United States that would be the exact URL but just look for the feel driver on Wacom's website. They make the technology, so that gives you some good additional features here. You get a control panel and a lot of settings here. So you can assign what the button does here, double press, long press, all that sort of thing. The barrel buttons, there are two of them, what you want those to do. And you can calibrate it. And there's a simple calibration and an extended calibration. Now Wacom AES is different from EMR. It doesn't have that problem with edge drift so much. It stays pretty accurate even to the edges of the screen. But the calibration is still never a bad idea. You can go ahead and do that and redo that anytime that you need. There is pressure sensitivity. It's fine for OneNote. I mean, any tablet these days is just fine for taking notes. But you can see there I'm having problems with palm rejection not working really well on this. And that's weird because usually Wacom AES works pretty well. In fact, I sometimes like it a little bit better than Entrick because it has lower initial activation force. You don't have to press as hard to get a line on the screen is what that means. I find that I really do have to rest my hand against the glass first so I can tell the difference between my hand and the pen. Now for painting and drawing, I like Wacom AES pretty well. Like I said, it's up there with Entrig, not quite as good as the certainly the Mobile Studio Pro from Wacom, which has their latest generation pen technology with over 8,000 levels of pressure sensitivity, but I was able to draw this, or paint this rather, using Sketchbook, which isn't even a very paint-centric program. And let's go to something like the pen and see if I can actually draw in. And I'm resting my hand on here successfully now, giving a little highlight on his eyebrow. And it works just fine. So if you're thinking about this for art as well, I don't think that latitudes are really the first thing that come to mind for folks when they're thinking about art, but actually it's a perfectly viable solution for art. 
So that's the Dell Latitude 5285. Not exactly a household name the way Surface Pro 4 may be among at least tech enthusiast types, pen loving people, all that sort of thing. So what would be the reasons to buy this instead of Surface Pro 4? Other than the fact that Surface Pro 4 had driver teething pains when it first came out due to the Intel Skylake chipset having teething pains really with Windows 10 in conjunction. Um, this one has an Intel 7th generation CPU inside. We're still waiting for that for Surface Pro 4 to happen. This one has two USB-C ports. Yay, so Surface Pro 4 currently has none. Uh, I think a real deciding factor for a lot of you is going to be because your company already buys Dells and everybody who wants a Surface Pro 4 kind of device can get one of these instead because your company has a contract with Dell. There are a few more security options available like the smart card reader and the NFC based security so some corporations care about them. Those will be the reasons and obviously some of them will be moot because at some point we don't know when Microsoft will update Surface Pro 4 to Pro 5 and I'm sure it'll have 7th gen CPUs by then probably will have USB-C maybe even Thunderbolt 3, though it's pretty hard to fit Thunderbolt 3 in a design this small, so likely not so much there. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos and thumbs up if you like this vid.